Happy Thanksgiving Monday to all you turkey-stuffed, slightly less miserable accursed. I'm David Hurley here with two-thirds of our political panel. Right this second, Jordan Leichnitz is chairing some big conference in Germany. Not sure why that rates is more important than being here and having her 17th Pharmacare argument with Corey, but we'll just have to live with it. But here's the good news. Scott Reed is not chairing a conference in Germany this week, and neither is Corey tonight. Fellas, we got ourselves a mantle today. Who's going to provide the left-leaning voice to compensate for Jordan's absence? Corey, you up for it? I will. Yeah. I'm up for yeah, it. I think, I'm up for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. All I would say is that if I was chairing a conference in Germany, watch out France. <laughs> <laughs> well, nor- normally Belgium first, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Work your way to France. <laughs> All right, here's the topic for today. It's a big one, and we'll stick with it as long as there's juice. The Liberal Caucus Revolt, a story that's been developing since Friday afternoon. We'll get into all of it. Our cursed clipping is Jeffrey Simpson's opinion piece in The Globe on Saturday. Incumbency, inflation, immigration, and identity, the four fatal eyes of Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. Then it's Mr. Pinsent with our hey you. So, Corey and Scott, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. I'm I'm out in Souk. With Um, your family. Yep, uh, seeing my parents and uh, my sister and my nephew. So very full of turkey and uh, uh, was uh, was great. Just uh, beautiful out here. <laughs> Sioux Harbor yeah. House, for those who've never been, should uh, come and check it out. It's uh, been closed for four years, but just, just reopened last week. And it's uh, it's got uh, a lot of work put into it. It's beautiful. Beautiful. And you beat cool. your mom at Scrabble last night. <laughs> I, I didn't know. Uh, no, oh. my my nephew did. Um, but it's a it's a rare night when uh, uh, when my mom loses at Scrabble. You know, this is p- yeah. part of being a a, a lifelong uh, English teacher. You you know all the secret words. Yeah, yeah. Scott, what were you doing this weekend? I had uh, had three of four sons. One was in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, but I had three of four sons uh, over Thanksgiving dinner. I ate. So many mashed potatoes, so many plates of mashed potatoes smothered in butter and salt that when it came time to drive my son Will home, I I couldn't get in the car. I couldn't drive. I couldn't couldn't lift my arms high enough to hold a steering wheel. uh, Just rest them on your stomach. It'll be. No, literally, I had to get into a reclining chair and focus all of my energies. On breathing, inhale and exhale. I had to remember both parts. That's that's how full I was. So, did you eat those mashed potatoes without gravy? This is a this is an important thing. Uh, absolutely, I did. I I am opposed to gravy on potatoes. What's the point? What's the point of gravy on potatoes? It ruins the potato. I want the pure potato taste with butter with salt. Now, I do put gravy on my stuffing. And on my turkey, but I try to uh, bifurcate uh, my my plate up so that you know these things don't intermingle. I don't like mixing of my things. I want them. I want. You're them starting to sound like J D Vance or something, saying yeah. some weird <laughs> shit that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Where, where are you on cranberries? Where are you on cranberry sauce? I don't like cranberries either. I'm just like oh, J D. I don't like cranberries, mm-hmm. and I'm doubling down on uh, why uh, people should have children, no matter whether there's climate change or not. That's that's my treatise. All right, let's fucking talk. <coughs> It was not to have been leaked, apparently. It wasn't part of the plan to leak it, but there is a letter moving around the Liberal caucus, apparently hand-to-hand, no electronic distribution, no copies floating around, hand-to-hand for signature, asking the Prime Minister to step down. I think they were aiming for 50 or so signatories. My understanding is that they were well short of that at the time that it was leaked, probably in the 25 or 30 range so let's say they got 30 signatures on a letter asking the prime minister to go and now it's a public story scott what are your thoughts Mm. well i'll be goddamned if i can find any of those 30 mps who will admit to it so i work on the following assumption i work on the assumption that it's real and that that it's more real than your traditional garden variety grumbling that's been going on for about six to eight months that there was I think a moment this week, uh, um, 
which brought things to a head. I think the absence of the prime minister, the absence of Katie, mm-hmm. it was sort of like they left the castle undefended and the drawbridge down and they said, here are the lesser knights that we're going to ask you to listen to at the front of the Great Hall. And people said, fuck this noise. Mm-hmm. So I do think, I think whatever it is, and I have to acknowledge, I think we have to acknowledge it. We don't know exactly what it is, but it seems like there's real frustration, real pent up frustration that's bubbling over. Um, but what I think is kind of curious is now it's not just that nobody wants to come forward. Now there's competing stories about how many there's competing stories about, you know, was a letter calling on him to resign? Was the letter demanding change? Was uh, the plan to give it to him privately? Was it to perhaps uh, turn it into verse and have someone sing it to him? Like it's, you know, there's just, it's very, very, very muddy and murky. And now no one even privately will admit that they pledged their name to it. Um, so I think there's a I think there's a very real prospect. I think it's a real 50-50 thing. I think this could tilt toward um, it rolling further downhill and causing big problems and management challenges for the prime minister. I think it could also recede and people would just say, well, the, the presence of sunlight and media scrutiny is causing me to retreat. And, um, but even if that happens, and this would be the, I think the more, I, I don't know if you guys agree with this. Even if this thing, uh, is all blanks shot out of a shotgun aimed at the sky. I still think it's a pretty serious problem for the prime minister because it is at minimum, in the context of this leader's caucus and the history of this caucus, it is at minimum an authentic expression that there's a sizable portion of his caucus that has had it, that's fed up with the more of the same message, that feels patronized, that boomerang between being frustrated and resigned to their fate. And even even this relatively on the leash group have decided they're going to bite back. Now, they may not bear their fangs now, but I think if I'm the prime minister, I now know, I now know that I can't just take all this for granted. And I know that I've got to manage these people. And I don't think... I don't think they're very used to managing people. And I don't know that they haven't, they didn't live through Turner Kretchen. They didn't live through Kretchen Martin. They don't, you know, they look at disdain with that portion of history and they like, you know, constantly deride it. But they also don't have the benefit of building up any of those muscles, scar tissue, any sense of history as to how to do that. I think their impulse, and it could be could be very bad, uh, their impulse is to barge through the room and tell everybody to shit, sit down, shut up and listen harder. And I think that... That could go badly in this situation. So we'll, we'll have to see from here. But I, I think even if this is an aborted rebellion, it's still an incredibly troubling sign for Trudeau and tells you there is a clock and you, sir, are on it. Interesting. Corey, what's your take? Is this something or nothing? It's a something. It's a something. I largely agree with what Scott just said. Like, look, it was 25 MPs that brought down Margaret Thatcher. You don't need to have a majority. You don't. You just need to have a sizable number. Look at uh, how life, how difficult life was for Stockwell Day when when twelve members of the caucus uh, decided to revolt. Uh, it, it it created a, a pressure that made it basically impossible for him to stay ultimately. So uh, I think it's I think it's a significant number. I, I'd be curious, uh, you know, who, who wrote. Uh, the letter initially and uh, and and how they did it like was it a chat GPT thing like in in the form in the style of a Shakespearean sonnet uh, uh, but uh, look kidding, kidding aside uh, you know I, I think I think it is important I think it, it's as Scott says it's the first sign of people getting serious about their discontent and uh, and getting really worried about what an election is going to look like. You know, I, I, what's changed to make it so much more serious? I, I think the loss of the confidence and supply agreement has got people more focused on the potential of, of an election immediately as opposed to, to at the end of their, their natural term. So the wait and we'll see if things improve narrative is uh, is a lot shakier in this circumstance. It's, well, we could be in an election before Christmas. And if that happens, what does that look like for me? And, oh, my God, I'm going to lose. Uh, so I, I think it's really turned up the temperature on the stove and, and uh, uh, left unattended. Uh, it's the stove, uh, the pot on the stove started to boil over. Corey, those, those MPs that left the Canadian Alliance over Day's leadership did something. <laughs> they left the Canadian Alliance and they formed a splinter group in the House of Commons. The, right? the DRC. The DRC. When, when, 
when Scott and I uh, were uh, doing our thing with uh, Kretchen, there was a leadership review vote coming up, right? These guys don't have an or else. I don't think you need an or else, though. Like, you know, uh, the or else could be, you know, just the prospect of leaving caucus. It can be the prospect of coming out on a, you know, on a daily or weekly basis to, uh, to call for his removal, uh, going on talk shows, uh, going out to the media and scrums. Like these are all, all things that, that just make it, take it from a, a difficult period for the, for the prime minister and his team to actually communicate and get messages through on what they want to do or what they want to do differently or what they want to do next. And, and they just crowd it out completely where the only conversation then is your leadership. And it starts to have a, a, a narrative of, of when, not if. Like, you know, Trudeau is going to be gone soon. Whether it's after the next election or whether it's before is the only question. And how long you measure that, it's anything from, from weeks to months. But it's, it's not years at this point. Right. Right. Can, can I just add on that quickly, David? I, I, because yeah. I think it's really a critical question. When you talk about well, there isn't a mechanism, there isn't a nor else there. And Corey talks about, well, you know, just the agony and the, the spectacle of people coming to the mics. We don't even have that. And if I was going to bet, I'm not even sure we will have that. Maybe, maybe somebody will show up with this one lone piece of paper, you know, this, uh, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, there doesn't and appear say, to be a leader to this group. There doesn't appear no. to be a Pietro Rizzuto who is the, exactly. organizing this thing. So I think let's work on the assumption that I am, for the sake of convene, uh, discussion over the course of the past 48 hours, that that it won't even manifest itself that explicitly, that there won't be a presentation of the prime minister, that there won't be three, four, five, six people going to microphones. Maybe that's wrong. And if it is, then that's a more serious management problem. But I think you have to, I'm curious about, even if none of that occurs, and maybe people around the prime minister say, see, this was all just, um, you know, these are all Ken dolls. You pull their pants down. There's nothing but molded plastic there, right? We've uh, <laughs> like, there's nothing. So um, maybe, but I still think even in that circumstance, you know, it creates a weight, you know, on top of everything else. I mean, the common mm -hmm. supply agreement disappears. You know, your, uh, your campaign director is gone. There's no urgency to replace it. There's no urgency to change cabinet, no urgency to alter message. And caucus is being told, hey, by the way, some of these underlying demographics starting to shift in our direction, probably like our priorities, um, you know, the economy is strengthening. We're going to make some changes. We'll see. We'll have some cards to play. Uh, there's going to be some government advertising. We're going to wait until after the U.S. election. And... I think a bunch of them are just like, uh, that's not, that won't work. Like they're literally going, that won't, that's not, that's bullshit. That isn't going to work. And so just the weight even, I think, alters the chemistry of this government. The weight of knowing when you walk into a room, a third of the people here want me to go. And maybe another third do, but don't even have the confidence to anonymously contribute their name to a Globe and Mail story. Like I just think that 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 alters that alters dynamics. It alters decision making. Cookie cutter. Here's a term you hear often applied to new home development, as in, "Geez, will you look at this neighborhood? It's just cookie cutter houses." Well, we've been talking about Telus living here for a few weeks now their new mixed-use, purpose-built rental residential portfolio. It's the antithesis of cookie-cutter hurly-burlyites. By definition, you can't be cookie-cutter if innovation is at the heart of what you're doing. So let me tell you some of the ways Talus Living stands apart from other new builds in the market. Advanced technological integration. Talus Living properties are equipped with Talus's state-of-the-art fiber optic connectivity and smart home solutions. Community-centered design. These homes come in a variety of layouts and unit sizes with features that foster community engagement, including community gardens, fitness centers, and co-working spaces. Commitment to accessibility and affordability. TELUS Living aims to provide purpose-built rental units for middle-class families and essential workers, typically within 40% of household income. Built with proximity in mind so that essential workers have housing in a convenient location to their workplaces. Sustainable development practices. 
The project adheres to high environmental standards, incorporating energy-efficient systems, sustainable materials, and green building practices. I could go on and tell you about holistic living experiences like access to TELUS's communications, health, and well-being services. But I think in the last month or so, we've been talking about this, so you're getting the picture. By leveraging their expertise in connectivity and innovation, TELUS Living is redefining what it means to create vibrant, sustainable, and connected communities, and in the process, transforming cookie cutter into cutting edge. Go to TELUSLiving.com to learn more. Yeah, but, you know, you, it's interesting, you, you picked up on the exact opposite of what I picked up on out of this. Because you're like, hey, these people won't stand behind it, they won't stand up and attach their names to it. I have been shocked by the stunning silence from the caucus in support of Trudeau, other than Mary Ng. Where are the defenders? Where are all the people rushing to microphones to denounce these people and to say, no, Trudeau should lead us? I heard zilch over the weekend. Did you hear anything? Nothing. No. I assume they'll force some of those out. I assume that that would be the PMO's next play. They'll deputize some people to go make some phone calls, and then from those phone calls, they'll force some people out. But it's harder to play that card when it's a when it's a recess week. You know, it's like, well, you know, I was gonna go. I'm, I got like I got some, you know, I got some polls outside of North Bay that I thought I'd visit, and I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get to a phone or a telegram. And, uh, I think it's know. hilarious they put Mary Ng out in defense, by the way, Corey. Well, she There's was there, to be a member right? of caucus who's seen by the other caucus members to have been more favored by this administration than Mary Ng. Yeah, uh, it's an odd choice. But just in terms of, you know, what to interpret, you know, I, they may not be screwing around yet, but they saw, they've they signed up for Ashley Madison. Like, they're thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're starting to take us in that direction. It's, it, it does not portend well for the marriage, let's put it that way. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think that, that'll be the test to see how things are going. Who can you, who can you bring out that's outside a cabinet? Who in caucus is actually going to... To, to carry a, a banner for you going uh, going into the next election uh, and do so in, a, in an enthusiastic way and and actually go out and say no 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 uh, Trudeau is actually the best person to represent us and and we are better off if he is the leader going into the next election I'd really like to meet that caucus member and um, uh, and maybe we'll sit them down and do a personality and an IQ test I don't know <laughs> we'll, we'll study them in a lab and see what's what's actually wrong with them. I assume we'll hear from people around the prime minister saying, what, what's going on? What are you guys, you guys like going on TV, talking about like this is some kind of earthquake. Jesus Christ, there is no letter. There's been no presentation of the prime minister. None of these MPs will stand up and say so in public. You know, so come on, this is all bullshit. And I just think no matter how this thing plays out, I keep coming back and I'll take your point as well, David, right? You also don't hear any any, any rousing defense uh, from the other side for the PM. But the there are concrete fundamental challenges that can't be gotten around that this all just kind of shines a further light on, which is like, why and how? Why are you staying? And how are you going to persuade the public that the government deserves another term? Like, what is it all about, man? Like, what what is it all about? We didn't hear a syllable about what it's all about, what the plan going forward, what the indispensable need for voters to return Justin Trudeau to the prime minister's office is in that podcast he gave with Nate Erskine Smith. And I, I think that no matter how this plays out, that is on everyone's mind constantly now. And... Uh, I, you know, like that, that weight this is just, it feels like a cement block uh, that the prime minister is dragging around his neck. Well, a, a couple of things around this. First, I, I think you're right in terms of how they'll, they'll respond. Scott saying, well, what letter? I haven't seen it. And no one's, no one's shown us anything and uh, all of that, which only increases the amount of mystery and intrigue around the thing. Like it, it makes it, it makes it sexier to talk about, not less sexy. And uh, it invites this to story to continue. The second thing I'll say is I think the Erickson Smith interview was is actually is the catalyst for this. I think it I think it was worse than either of the two by elections that they lost that they should have won. 
I think the window into what the prime minister's thinking was and just how self-involved and detached from reality he was, uh, was, was laid bare in that interview in a way that, that shook the confidence of caucus worse than anything any uh, mere by-election could produce. Yeah. Hey, Corey, just is 30 signatories a lot or a little? It's a lot. It's a hell of a lot. As I say, you know, 20, 25 to take out Margaret Thatcher, it, you know, it was less than that to take out Patrick Brown. I don't recall any letters coming from caucus uh, to, to show Andrew Shear the door. Uh, you know, 12 for uh, getting rid of uh, Stockwell Day. Like, you know, yeah, it's, it's a very significant number. And it's a significant number in the context of a caucus that has shown no inclination towards rebellion in the past. You know, if you if you look at the caucus that got rid of Patrick Brown, like, look, they they were wanting to do a coup on a leader, you know, every second Tuesday, and uh, were constantly in the media backbiting uh, the the preceding leaders. So, yeah, in the con- it's a big number in the context of any example around a change in leadership, and it's a particularly big number in the context of this caucus. I'll go further. Than but if that, he doesn't David, want to go, Scott, he doesn't go, right? Because like. Rizzuto, I think, I'm trying to remember, let's ballpark it. Rizzuto got, I think, 25 signatures out of 40 in like 1987 for Turner to step down. And he said no. Yeah. Um, different era. Different era. And I like, I don't know how relevant the historical precedents are on things like this. I, I, I guess I would say. Well, then what do I offer? <laughs> well, if not history, what's the point of having all this gray hair growing out of my ears? Uh, look, I um, I just think this. I'll answer the question you put to Corey. I think th- I think thirty could be an unsurvivable number. Like if you actually had thirty members of Parliament come forward with a statement as stark as "We just think you should go," um, not not qualified by you know what, Prime Minister, we love you and respect you, and we're just asking you to put forward a new program. And if you can't put forward a new energetic program, then maybe you should consider whether or not there's another hobby or a course you might wish to take, something that you could adopt as opposed to being our leader any longer. But if it's a hard like you got to go, uh, I don't know that it's survivable because I think then it. Then the prime minister's office digs in and the PM digs in and says, I'm going nowhere. Then even suggesting, well, you know what? I'm going to make some changes. Maybe they get dug in on that. They say, no way. We're not going to. That shows weakness. They're not going to show that weakness. We're not going to let them dictate to us that we got to make changes. We're not going to back off the carbon tax because 30 members of parliament said no. So it actually, it, it will, it, it could have the consequence of them cracking down harder on caucus, um, taking disciplinary action, refusing to move off the status, status quo, intensifying the degree to which they uh, say to people, it's not as bad as it looks. And I think that could mean that 30 turns into 60 and 60 turns into who knows what. And it could be very isolating. And again, I go back to it. I'm not certain that this group has the skills and the experience uh, in managing this kind of thing. I think it'll be all discipline, no diplomacy. And I think it could get very ugly very quickly. But right. that that is not happening right now. And I don't actually predict that, that those 30 signatures will come forward. But if it does, I think that that is, um, I, I think that is a comet across the sky telling the dinosaurs to duck. But you, you actually believe there's less here than meets the eye. I do. I've, I think that, I, I think there may have been less to it than meets the eye to begin with. I think that um, it's public exposure has to, I think, I, I've talked to people this weekend that I'm convinced have signed the letter and don't want to admit it to me in private conversations. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that, but if that's true, that tells you something about this. There is a phrase used by railroaders at our sponsor, CN. They talk about the CN way. It's an intriguing phrase. I did a little reading about it recently, and as far as I can tell, it was coined decades ago by the chief executive and former Privy Council clerk who guided the railroad from being a money-losing crown corporation to the efficient, industry-leading Class 1 railroad it is today. But even Paul Tellier had trouble defining the phrase. The CN way is not Canadian, he once said, and it is not American. Among other things, he said it is an instinct to challenge convention and an openness to new ideas. Since then, 
Other CN leaders have used the phrase in talking about diversity, about treating colleagues and shareholders and clients with respect, about taking responsibility for the railway's impact on the lives of those it touches, about embracing innovation and striving for excellence. And of course, operating with primary regard for people's safety, railroaders, customers, and the people who live along the CN network. If that all sounds sort of Pollyannish, well, whatever. I think it probably boils down to something pretty simple, trying to do the right thing. It might be a hard concept to define precisely in the execution, but you know, we all know it when we see it. As I record this, it is Thanksgiving in Canada, and it strikes me that the CN way is a perfect means for actualizing gratitude for the life we enjoy in this country. You really can't go wrong trying to do the right thing. It's that simple. Well, it, it's stages towards, I think, coming out in a more public way. Like this is, this is a. I don't mean sign it, by the way. I mean, I mean, committed to signing it, even you know, yeah. even over the threshold. Sure, but these these are steps along a path, and the path is only going in one direction. And and I think the courage that you're seeing of people, you know, it's uh, to to entertain these sorts of things. Yes. Uh, is increasing clearly. And and I think the bigger thing is wh- where we started with this. Who's going to come out and actually offer a vigorous defense? Because I, I think it's actually looking at the two in concert that really tells the story uh, of, of, of waning uh, control over caucus and uh, and waning belief that, that anything is going to change uh, under the current uh, leadership. And, and, you know, like, I, I don't think uh, Katie did herself any favors tweeting about uh, the Asia conference, uh, you know, as in response to this, as opposed to taking it on more directly. Like, I think it, it all just looks like, you know, burying your head in the sand uh, sort of uh, response, which... Totally, which, that tweet which, was like, <laughs> nothing to see here, folks, right? Yeah, but clearly there is something to see and 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 not acknowledging it, it you know it, it feeds into the, uh, what I think is this toxic narrative that came out of the Erskine Smith uh, interview, which is uh, you know living in an alternate reality. Yeah, whistling so past the graveyard. Make- whistling past the graveyard could be as dangerous as overreacting and cracking down too harsh in this environment because whistling past the graveyard says to people you really do not fucking hear me and and that causes people to go from resignation uh to anger like the electorate (laughs) which is so they did something they did something yeah um they did something the day after this all broke they uh leaned on andrew bevan and got him to agree to be the campaign director so now they have a campaign director to replace broadhurst i have so many mixed emotions about this you guys i love andrew bevan like as a person he's a really close friend of mine secondly i think he's one of the smartest people i've worked with in politics and one of the most able practitioners of government from a political standpoint that i've seen uh i presume he'll do a good job of this but this isn't where he should be this isn't where he should be. He should, I mean, it's what what I said last week is what should be the case is Telford should have taken this job and he should have gone into Telford's role. And one of the things that fills me with despair about Andrew taking this job is that I had really counted on the fall economic statement and a potential budget to be um, idea laden things, measure things with measures that would offer an alternative path for the government. And that seems to me a lot less likely now that he's left this job and gone to uh, gone to run the campaign. Well, look, it doesn't matter how great a construction engineer you are. You're not going to build the Eiffel Tower with uh, half a box of mixed match Lego pieces, which is what I think Bevan's got to work with right now. It's, it's you know, I, I you know, uh, good on him for, for stepping up and, and taking on uh, a job like this when you're almost certainly looking at a, an epic defeat. Uh, so, you know, he's I, a soldier. I, I, There's no doubt I, about I, that. I've got a lot of respect uh, for, for anyone who does that, but like, what do you have to work with? And, and if you, know, what you have to work with is we're not going to change course on a carbon tax. If we're not going to uh, make any market change in, in the overall agenda or communications approach of the government other than starting to run some some government ads 
Uh, I, I just think you've got so little to work with. You've basically no money in the campaign war chest. You've got uh, you've got very little in terms of the tools that that you would need to 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 actually bend a curve on this in, in any direction. Hmm. Scott, well, speaking of curves, there is the uh, economists approved and well researched and firmly established phenomenon of the fucked government curve, which is the longer you wait to make change, the harder it becomes for you to make change. And the far less likely it is that you'll be rewarded for any of the change that you finally make. And they are firmly in this world now because even when it They're comes to They're in deathbed like, repentance world where everything you do is viewed through, right. oh, you're just trying to fuck So this right. curve, this curve is charted very badly since July 1st, 2023. And, um, so I just I, I put that out there. I'll say one other tactical thing about all of this uh, over the course of the weekend. Um, I really hope, just as a matter of craft, that they do not come forward next week and insist in public or in backgrounding stories that Andrew's appointment had been long in the making and that it was well established that he was going to do this job and it had nothing to do with the letter, it had nothing to do with the reports, it had nothing. The fact that it was blasted out at 8 a.m. on nothing Thanksgiving to do with Sunday. Matt Stickney saying no, nothing to do with anybody complete else. Complete coincidence. No. This was actually, they, we've been working on this for at least 10 days and here's a piece of evidence I would point you toward. The, uh, I hope we don't get that bullshit thing because again, it would reinforce. You know what? We don't get it. We don't get it. Like the only value of it, other than having a competent person running the campaign, is surely to Pete that you're trying to demonstrate some concession to caucus discontent and demonstrating you hear them. So if if you decide by impulse and instinct to deny that, um, and I like I think that would be a mistake. And I, I really feel like that it's very possible that that will happen. I share all of your views about Andrew, as you know. I love the guy. Um, I have worked with him super closely, many different wars over the years. Um, I share your anxiety about him taking on the role. I'll add this. I, like, all of us has worked in politics. If the prime minister had called me on Saturday and said, you have to become the national campaign director. I would find it goddamn near impossible to say no. When the prime minister taps you and says, I want you to do this. We're in a fix. We're in a corner. I need you to do it. It's really, really, really hard to say no. So spare a bit of sympathy. Uh, the degree of practical discretion to someone who has the loyalty, the commitment, the integrity of someone like Andrew, that, that you have almost no capacity when you're squarely faced with that request to decline it. Um, That's what if Hugh Siegel used to say about why he went to B. Mulroney's principal secretary in the last mm -hmm. stages. The prime minister asked me. Prime minister yeah. asked you to do something, you do it. Well, what else? Well, so like, other than that, then you just go to a fishing lodge in the Northwest Territories for the rest of your life. Because like that, mm -hmm. so, um, so that's the first thing that... Uh, that only other thing I would I want to add to your point about the fall economic statement about what this might pretend. Um, yes, of course, they needed to fill the position. But the really important takeaway is that the instinct to not fill the position for four weeks and to tell caucus and observers that it was no big deal that they weren't filling the position is the point. That is the point. That's what aggravated people. It's it's not that that in and of itself was such a monumental thing. It was that it was so emblematic of the mushrooming of just stick me in the dark and feed me shit. Come on. You're telling me that it's no big deal as the house turns into gummed up, locked up chaos where there's a confidence vote every other week and the confidence and supply agreement no longer persists and the blocker saber rattling. You're telling me that not having a campaign director in, in place is a rational thing to do, that it's no big deal and we'll take our time. So yes, addressing it was a necessity, but but not by, not by it does not necessarily um, really respond to the... Um, to the underlying frustration that you're that these 30 MPs, so to speak, if that's the number, are expressing. 
I really worry about the fall of the economic statement. There was one small media report I saw, just a little bit of backgrounding somewhere. And so it, like written smoke, could count for absolutely nothing, right? But it made mention of the fact that someone in government was suggesting that probably would have a fall of the economic statement with no measures. Here's why that upsets me so much. And I myself called for this four weeks ago. Like, so... It means that there's been a psychological and strategic shift. It means that they've now decided, all right, when we say we're not going to prorogue, that's actually our preferred course. We, we want to stick to that. We want to stick with this. Nothing to see here. We're going to carry on. We're going to pretend that all this cannon fire and these lights and rocket fire mean nothing. And we're not going to prorogue the House. We'll avoid a confidence vote by just having a fall economic statement without measures in it. We'll move Andrew over uh, to the campaign director. And... It, it, all of those things imply, and I'm going off of one backgrounded sentence in one media story, I know, but it that is a that is a, a skeleton key that unlocks a door into a strategic room that says, just stay the course, no, no more change, nothing, because you're not going to prorogue, you're not going to put yourself in jeopardy for that, you're just going to carry forward. And I think they but, are losing the But don't the diminish your source. It's obviously not going to be a big, I mean, if it was going to be a big deal, Bevan could not be walking away from it right now. They got to make change, whether they want to or not, whether the fucked up government curve is killing them or not, they've got to make change. And so if this means that there will be no fall economic statement of consequence and therefore there'll be no signaling of change and no process of trying to undo the consumer carbon tax, then literally you're just saying to people, the line forms to the right, we're going to the top of the volcano, make certain you wear swimwear because we're all diving in. Yeah. Hey, Corey. Thinking about Bevan's new job, do you um, do you think that campaigns are ever designed to save the furniture as opposed to just win, try to win? And how are they different if they are? I think you got to always be trying to design them to win, even when it's completely improbable. Um, it's the same thing. It's my feeling. You, it's the same things that you need to do. Like you're talking about trying to build a electoral coalition that, that that is plausible and move people or persuade people with a you know with a program with a series of of, of issues or policies what what have you uh, that helps to get you there and a leader leader that's communicating them effectively. So you know. It, it, you know, you, you end up and save the furniture because that hasn't resonated. That voter coalition is too small. But, you know, the, the, the approach that you're taking is I don't think it's it's different. I don't know what a save the furniture design campaign would look like, I guess, other than, you know, where you're spending your tour time and where you're dedicating your your scarce resources around platform ID. advertising. Mm -hmm. You could, for instance, focus only on the major cities in the country. Yeah. If you were the liberals, right? Well, I, I think you're probably going to see some version of that, you know, so, you know, where, do, where does that come? It's not in, not in the narrative. It's in, in the focusing of resources. You know, you're, you know, you're going to be campaigning in a very different set of seats, uh, you know, that, uh, that you can plausibly win when you're at this level in the polls for the liberals. But, um, uh, and maybe you're, you're cutting out some media markets where you're, you've just written off completely. Like there's no point contesting in these areas, but I, I, th I think you see that even in, even in winning campaigns in, in Canada today, you see versions of that for every party. You know, the, the liberals are, are not uh, spending a lot of money in Western Prairie, uh, media markets, nor have they in a long, long time. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah, you got to swing for the fences every time you're at bat. Scott, you got a thought about that? I I feel exactly the same. And it's funny, I had a reporter talk to me about this the other day, and they, they raised this question about, well, you know, uh, maybe you recognize you're not going to win, and so you pursue a strategy that allows you to do as well as possible, and then you live to it. And I'm like, I don't know how you build that campaign. I don't know how you build a campaign that says, I want to do good, not great. I want to do okay, <laughs> not... Like, I, like, honestly, right? Like, I mean, if you're not... I just think... And I think it's into... I've always believed, and goodness knows my track record is mixed, had some wins, had some losses, but I've always believed that the best way to finish as strong as possible is to be trying as hard to win as much as you can. And like if you, 
If you shoot for second place, there's a strong chance you'll slide to third. If you shoot for first, then hopefully the worst you end up is second. I just, uh, I, I don't have a lot Although to add. Not inherently, Scott, not inherent. No, no, I know there are other uh, t- technical <laughs> possibilities. But, um, but, I mean, I guess the case for it is what? That you would make certain different choices with respect to resources. You would um, pursue different, I, I, I mean, I, I just don't know. Well, in 2014, how, in 2014, when we won in Ontario, we basically pulled our resources out of the Southwest early. Yes, but that was in order to win. That was to maximize. It right. wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't. It, it wasn't to guard against. And, the, and that's it's not a me- that's not the messaging side of it. Like, I, I guess the, the, where the messaging side, if if you really think that that your time is up is saying that your leader's not going to run again. Like, you know, you guys were, were forced into that in 2018. You know, some some stories written about that in the last uh, little while. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're already contemplating it at this time, the obvious question is, why aren't you just changing the leadership before the race? Mm. That's the obvious question <laughs> right. I, i've thought about that as a thought exercise i've thought well what if justin trudeau pulled a page out of his dad's 1980 playbook and said you know what i'll commit uh then i'm going to step down within two years this will be my last term whatever have you whatever the variation is on it but i can't make it work in my head because if it's not accompanied first of all his dad was in the ascendance at that point right because clark had fallen and then there was this but also um so it was a point of reassurance as a point to a credential of uh of 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 uh, have a second look at me. Um, but I don't, like, if it's unaccompanied by an, an activist agenda where you're saying, I, I must keep this job because the public will not get these three things without me. And I'm going to get you those three things and then I'm happy to pack it in. Uh, but there's not, there's been none of that. So I don't, there's I don't also think no you can three make things. it work. There's also mm-hmm. no three things. Yeah, that's what that's I mean. Right. That's what that's what yeah. I'm saying. Is there's no three? Well, things. there are there are the three things though. You know that they, they have things that that they're promising to continue. It's just they're insanely unpopular. Like they're promising to raise the carbon tax in April. Like that, that's one of the three things that you know you get if there's an election between now and then. Uh, it's just not a good thing. It's like hey, if you're a good boy all the way till Christmas, you'll get this lump of coal. <laughs> All right, if we weren't being, if the motif of this show was not unremittingly bleak for the liberals, then we might, is there any light here for them? I mean, there are reasonable jobs numbers out there. Interest rates are coming down. Uh, Coletto says Polyev's negatives are rising. Um, Is there any reason to think that there's going to be a better environment next spring? Because that's clearly what the theory, operating theory is. Next spring will be better. Yeah, I, I, I'm skeptical. But like the other thing that's almost certainly going to happen based on today's last few days numbers is Trump is going to be president. Um, you know, it's looking bleaker and bleaker for for the the Harris Wells campaign, and uh, and they've really spent a lot of time talking about how that's going to change the universe for them. We've been pretty skeptical whether or not that's the case. And I think the polling has cast a lot of doubt as to whether that will be the case, but uh, irrespective, they believe it will be. Uh, you know, as for inflation, you know, we've had, you know, 30% increases in prices in large areas of the economy and wages for those same workers are maybe up, you know, three to 5%. So you're way, way less off, uh, well off. So saying inflation uh, is going down is, is kind of like me saying, well, despite the fact I, I uh, gained 30 pounds last year, I'm only going to gain three pounds this year. But, you know, my, my waist size is only going up. It's, there's, it's, it's not a change in fortunes. Like we're not, you know, you haven't closed that affordability gap. All you're doing is, is decreasing the rate of its increase. Yeah, no, that really does seem to be the way it plays out. I mean, we're seeing it in the States where, you know, they've got obviously the same dynamic we have here. Uh, in fact, a much stronger economy, but they've got the dropping interest rates and they've got the uh, inflation leveled out. But if you ask a voter, they'll say, well, I was just fucking better off when Trump was the president than I am 
today. And and right. all the cl- all the clever graphs of oh well GDP growth was was stronger under Biden and it was under Trump. Well, uh, okay, sure, uh, I guess that's true. But uh, you know, when you look at the purchasing power of it, your average individual in the economy, it's way worse because of inflation. So you know, and and the economy is not uh, a bunch of Andrew coins, you know, sitting around with a OECD report. Uh, uh, cross-referencing numbers. It's people looking at their bills and how much money they have and whether or not a vacation's in the works this winter or whether or not uh, they have enough money for their kid to join hockey. Like it's, you know, it's just so different than uh, than that macroeconomic uh, egg-heady bullshit. Even if, even if those, so first of all, that I would concede for sure that there are positives out there. Um, but I think there's two factors. We've talked about one of them. One is, um, would you plausibly become the beneficiary of those things? I mean, they're undoing things that were are important to have undone. Like they're, you know, I think Mark Miller is a sensible, capable minister. I see him making moves on immigration that makes sense to me. Uh, but I don't know that you're going to be the beneficiary. I don't know that you're going to get credit for uh, taking incremental uh, necessary moves to un fuck a problem that people think you you created whether that's true or not um and then secondly i think you know even if people did come to believe oh i'm feeling these positive things and i am seeing more negativity out of uh, i'm starting to have doubts about pure polyev and all that sort of stuff they still have to get their heads around then casting a ballot once again for trudeau and so in order to do that they have to do something which we've talked about occasionally and Corey, to your credit you've always raised this which is Trudeau has to become admirable again in the minds of voters. And that's tough to do. Incrementally improving economic numbers, I don't think will reverse that tide. And so I go back to Trump and I think, and I'm not predicting this, I'm not saying this will happen, but I think in order to even have a swing at that, you'd have to do something that's very, very difficult for a government of Canada to do given the nature of our bilateral relationship with the United States. And that is, you'd have to go at Trump with an ax. You'd Because I believe there are more than 21% of Canadians that would say, this guy, especially if he's reelected and wants to impose a 10%, you know, uh, across the board uh, import tax. Like, I think there's a lot of people, whether it's because of the measures that a uh, resurgent Trump might take or the manner in which he would conduct himself or the vindictiveness with which he would rule the White House, house again i think there could be a lot of people that would say you know what i like a prime minister who stands up and says listen you know what i'm the resistance against this against this global threat that is a crazed presidency against donald trump i think there's more than 21 percent of canadians who would say well i fucking like that whoever that is whoever is carrying that message i'm for that but man oh man it's an incredibly difficult thing to do and you'll have a chorus of people saying that is a dangerous course to assume because he will just paint a bigger target on Canada, take it out on us, our industry, and there will be consequences. And so in order to even try to imagine a strategy that unlocks that admirability, I like what I see Trudeau fighting for, you'd have to follow such a radical and uh, course that, you know, I, I wonder people would it, it's just it's just hard to imagine. And all this stuff about, well, we'll be better positioned to incrementally manage and navigate the relationship. I don't think that changes the dynamic. So I think the only way to turn a Trump White House victory into a plus for Trudeau uh, would be to go at Trump directly and hard. And I have a hard time imagining the government would be willing to do that. Well, you would be placing the partisan interests of the Liberal Party ahead of the national interest in, 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 the, in the eye of a lot of Canadians at the same time, which is, well, I maybe. sort of think, what you're getting at. But, yeah. you know, I, 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 don't, I don't dispute that there, there is a market for that. For sure there is in Canada. But uh, Well, the, uh, other approach is, the, other, the other approach is, and, and we saw a glimpse of this, frankly, with the capital gains measure in the, in the, last, in the last budget, which is, in 2012, when Obama was running against Romney, the economy was bad and people blamed Obama for it. And they couldn't tell people it was good. And so what they did is they said, yeah, it's a bad economy, but in that bad economy, I'm fighting for you and that guy over there is fighting for other people, right? And so, 
and they can. I mean, now Romney was particularly susceptible to that attack, and far more susceptible than Polyev would be, I suggest, um, given his background in private equity and all that kind of stuff. But that is one other approach, which is to try to find a constituency of thirty percent, thirty five percent, and make it really devoted to you. I, I think we will see that. I'm unconvinced. I'm I, I'm not I'm not convinced that that can be pulled off. That the measure that the that the laser target focus on that message with measures to back it up. Um, I, I'm just I'm not sure. I think they'll do half measures, not full measures. I think that there's a wall of negative opinion on Trudeau that has to be factored into it. And the price of overcoming that perception. Um, but I think we'll see. I think we'll see that effort. I mean, it's the most plausible strategy to pursue. I'm not convinced it will melt the wall of ice that stands between him and re-election. Another interesting thing in the past week is a couple more polls out showing what I suspected all along that the NDP are not in second place or anywhere close to it. Uh, both campaign research and uh, and Abacus <clears throat> showing basically the same numbers. So that isn't the case. So I, I, I don't know. Um, Show them with six seats in uh, BC, Corey. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of them is probably not their leaders. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I guess we'll, we'll get some more indications as these uh, provincial elections uh, play themselves out, most importantly, the one in British Columbia. But, uh, um, yeah, it's difficult to imagine uh, that... Uh, the numbers showing that the NDP are in second place because of a surge of support in British Columbia is anything other than bullshit when every provincial poll is showing the NDP's support has been waning slightly. Uh, uh, but yeah, I would probably have been hesitant to publish that poll, frankly, if I were that pollster, but whatever. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it, it shows that things are actually pretty, pretty stable out there, just stable and, in, in a good way for Polyev and in a bad way for everybody else. Right. Right. All right. Anything more to say, you two, on this week in politics? No, I hope the I hemlock didn't. store is open. I, I want to go buy a whole full court. You've really cheered me up, David. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Come on. It was a cheery conversation. It could have been worse. It could have been worse. Listen, we've sucked up all of our time pretty much. We don't have time to do Jeff Simpson's uh, clipping justice, and I do want to do it justice because I was fucking excited to see Jeff Simpson return triumphantly to the pages of the Globe and Mail, one of Canada's best writers, in my opinion, over time. Um, so maybe we should just wrap it up. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. Scott, you got a hey you? Well, my hey you, I'm going to steal your hey you, I betting, I'm betting, David. My hey you is to Andrew Bevan. Um, you know, these are the toughest of tough times. You had this crazy weekend with anonymous reports, but they were treated very seriously. And boom, the Prime Minister gets off a plane and Andrew's going in to be campaign director on Sunday morning of Thanksgiving weekend. I wish him the best. Uh, the guy is um, brilliantly talented. I think it's going to take um, a Merlin-sized wizard to, uh, to, to to somehow pull this magic trick off. Um, but I, I I wish him the best, and I know him to be talented. Right. Here, here. That's, a good, that's yeah, a good one. Absolutely. We all endorse that. All endorse it. All right, Corey? Well, I'll, I'll stick with the campaign uh, manager theme, uh, but go in a slightly different direction. I want to do a hey you to uh, uh, Reg Downs and Shannon Andrews, who are, who are running the SAS Party campaign. Uh, and uh, we didn't get a chance to kind of get into it, but uh, the first sizable public poll uh, of the Saskatchewan elections out, and it's actually showing the Saskatchewan party doing doing quite well. And and I think uh, for you and I, we were a little surprised how well, uh, how much game they still had in Regina, which was, I thought, interesting. But uh, I think they're running a, a very good, well-disciplined campaign. And uh, uh, so, uh, hey, Reg and Shannon, uh, thinking about you guys and good luck. Has anybody laid a glove on them? I don't think so. I don't think so. No, it's a really it's a really uneventful campaign, and that's not in that's not what the NDP needed for a change election. <laughs> yeah, I, I and I really we talked about this on Hurley Burley when we were we doing our deeper dive with Brian Top into the mm -hmm. Saskatchewan uh, uh, provincial race. I think uh, Singh has just been so 
toxic to uh, to to folks um, uh, in in provincial NDP parties like across the country, but but probably no nowhere more so than Saskatchewan, where where you know Trudeau is deeply unpopular and Singh backing him is not a, a crime easily forgiven. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, my hey you also goes out to Andrew, but it's quite personal. Which is Andrew, my God. Let's hang together through this thing, for God's sake. Uh, you're not going to appreciate me from week to week on this show. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm in your corner. Uh, do a great job. My heart's 100% with you. And, uh, and I know that you'll work your ass off with it. But hopefully you'll still get back to Prince Edward County once in a while for a little family time. Anyway, take care, Andrew. Uh, take care, all of you accursed out there who stuck with us through this show. Uh, we'll be back next week with Jordan. In the meantime, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail, and uh, Corey and Scott for showing up and, uh, you know, nursing me through another one of these. We'll see you <laughs> next week. <laughs>